Let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Shalom to each of you. Today in this video, we are going to talk about the Passover Seder. Now, that term, Passover Seder, refers to a very special meal that we eat after the 14th day of the Jewish month called Aviv or Nisan, and at the beginning of the 15th day. Now, we need to remember something. We read in the Torah, and I'm speaking about in the book of Genesis, where it says, Vayehi Erev, Vayehi Boker Yom Echad, which means, and there came about evening, and it came about morning, one day. So, According to the scripture, the day begins at darkness. At the sundown, we have a new day. So we need to remember that because this meal is at the beginning of the 15th day of the Jewish month, Nisan, meaning in the early evening, and we partake of it for many hours. In fact, we usually do so from the time beginning around 8 o'clock all the way until midnight or after. So it's a very special, complex meal. And what I'd like to do in this video is to go through some basic parts of the Passover Seder so that we can understand it properly. Now, I mentioned an evening and a morning one day. We need to understand something else about Judaism. Judaism, when we look at the biblical calendar, we find that although months are lunar, years are not. Why? Well, when you look at Exodus chapter 12, that famous chapter in regard to Passover, some truths are given there at the beginning of that chapter concerning time, concerning marking of a year. And we read there that Passover is at the beginning of the year, and it uses the phrase Aviv, which is spring. So we cannot have Passover at any other season. Why is that important? Well, if I were to ask you the biblical calendar that Judaism uses, is it lunar or solar? Many people believe it's lunar. It is not. Now, Islam, that pagan religion, it follows a lunar cycle for their entire calendar. It is devoid of revelation of God. Although the months in Judaism are lunar, the years are based on a solar aspect. Why? Because in Islam, for example, you will find that their month of significance for them, Ramadan. Well, it appears in what season? The answer is all the seasons, because the lunar calendar falls short of the solar calendar by, by a little bit less than two weeks each year. So because of that, if you have a holiday that is in the spring, it will move to the winter and then eventually to the fall and to the summer and back to the spring, and it keeps going through. It cycles the entire year. Well, in the Bible, we read that Passover must be in the Aviv in the springtime. So, in Judaism, we add another month every two or three years so that Passover and all the holidays stay in the proper season. Why is that important? Because we want Passover to be associated with spring because spring signifies life. And Passover is the festival of redemption and there's an inherent relationship between redemption and life. Well, what I'm going to do is to go through the Seder, that is the order of the Passover meal, and we're going to talk about the various elements that you see before me, but we're also going to talk about what I'm wearing. Now, this is a burial garment. We would call it in, in uh, Judaism today a kittel. It comes from the Hebrew word that kuf tet lamet, which means uh, to kill. So one who has been put to death, he puts on a kittle, a burial garment. Now, in the Bible, in the New Covenant, 
we find that there's another word that is used for burial garments, and that is the word tachrechin. Why is that important? Well, in John chapter 20, this deals with the resurrection. You recall that Miriam, she sees the, the empty tomb. She's the one who gets to the tomb first by herself while it's still dark. She sees that the tomb is empty. She does not see the body of Yeshua. So she goes hurriedly to two disciples, one of which is Shimon or Simon Peter. And she tells these two that, that he's not there. With that information, Peter and the other disciple, and you can read about this in John chapter 20, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, they begin to run to the tomb. The other disciple outruns Peter. And we read that he goes to the entrance. He looks inside, but he does not enter. Now, Peter, we know about Peter. Peter loves to be first. Peter just, just bursts into everything head first. And that's exactly what he does. He goes into the tomb and he sees. The scripture says he sees two things. The tachrechin and also the sudar. So he sees the burial garment. And let me tell you, once this goes upon a corpse, it becomes tame. It becomes impure. But there's another, another part of the, the burial attire. And that is what I'm holding in my hand. It's called, both in Hebrew and Greek, a sudar, which is simply meaning a garment. It is based from the biblical word beged. Beged is just garment. If you look sometime at the book of Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41, it talks about a four-corner garment. And each of these four-corner garments, they're required at the corner, at the kanaf, to have a fringe, fringes, the titsit. And you see here that they've been removed. Why? Well, I wanted to give you an authentic example. What was done is the dead person was put in tachrechin over his body. And then spices and ointment would have been poured upon it. And then a talit, a prayer shawl, with the removal of the titsit on each of the four corners. Because a dead person... He's not required to do the law. So, likewise, when people go into a cemetery, they put their fringe garments inside their pants, not to mock the dead because the dead can't keep the, the, the commandments of God. So they're removed. And this is placed over the person that's deceased, over his head, and it's wrapped up in a special way to cover His face. Now, some have called this a faith, face cloth, and some of the English translations speak of this. Now, here's the point. Peter comes in, and he sees the takrechin, the burial garments, which are impure, laying in one place. And then separated from them is the sudar, this. Now, this would have been on the head of Yeshua, covering his face. But what's unique is that Peter says that he sees it folded up. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because according to Jewish law, when the talit is removed, you just don't throw it, wad it up, but you fold it in a specific manner. So when Peter came in, he saw that someone did just like I'm doing, folded it properly according to the traditional way. And what did they do? Well, he laid it not with the burial garments that were impure, but he set it separated. And therefore, Peter knew something. He knew that only a Jew would have done that. And which Jew did he think did it? Yeshua. And that's why it says when he looked and saw the sudar, the talit, without the titsit, separated from the burial garments, but folded up, and the emphasis is that it's folded up. He knew 
that Yeshua had risen from the dead, and the text says that he believes. Now, why do I share that with you? Very simply, because each year about this time, as we approach Passover, I get an email, the same email from dozens of people. And they all comment about something that they heard their pastor say or they read on the Internet about an ancient Hebrew tradition. Let me tell you, it's not an ancient Hebrew tradition. Because they point out that in some English Bibles, instead of translating it as it should, a garment, the four-corner garment, a sudar, they translate it not as a face cloth, which is not exactly right, but at least it, it captures the purpose of the talit that was used. No, it translates it as a napkin. And they say, you know, there's a tradition. If someone finished their meal and was not coming back, they would take that napkin and just wad it up next to the plate. And a wadded up napkin means what? That he's not coming back. But if someone left the table, but with the intent of returning and continuing eating, that napkin would be folded up. So they say Yeshua folded up that napkin as a way of saying, I'm coming back. Now that sounds really neat and wonderful. But the problem is, it wasn't a napkin. The problem is, it had nothing to do with one coming back, although he is coming back. It's not a napkin. It was a prayer shawl. And what it tells us is that Yeshua is alive. Now, he already told us that he is coming back. But that's not what the folded sudar signifies. Well, what I want to do at this time is to begin going through the Passover Seder. And there's various elements, various parts. And as I said, there's this book called the Haggadah, the telling that guides us through. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go through all the various blessings and everything that is read. I just want to give you a basic structure so that you're able to do two things, to follow and participate in the Seder, but add to it biblical truth. So as we go through, I'm sure that scripture will come into your mind that you can read because the whole purpose of this, remember, Exodus chapter 12 verses 25 and 26. It speaks about when you do this avodah. What's the term avodah? It means work or service. It says when you come into the land and you do this avodah, this service, your children are going to ask, what, what is this? And it gives you the privilege to fulfill the commandment of God by retelling the exodus from Egypt. Remember Passover, according to Scripture, it is the festival of redemption. Therefore, we're supposed to tell the story of redemption, not just remembering the exodus from Egypt, but remembering what the exodus of Egypt points to, and that is the work of Messiah. It is not uh, by accident that Messiah laid down his life on Passover. Now, we need to be very clear about something. Oftentimes, both in the Bible, both in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant, the term Passover is used for all the, the time period, meaning from the beginning of the observance of Passover, meaning the 10th day of Nisan, when we bring the lamb into our home, that's part of the Passover observance, all the way to the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, well, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days. Passover, in a strict sense, is just one day. It's the 14th day of the Hebrew month, Nisan, or Aviv, which is the day that the Passover lamb was killed. And then at nightfall, after cooking that lamb, not uh, uh, boiling it, but putting it on a spigot and roasting it, then we would eat of it at the beginning of the 15th day of that month, meaning at nightfall. Why? As we talked about, the Jewish day begins with sundown. So it's very important that we have the time element proper. So let's begin. What's the first thing that is done as we begin our observance of the Passover Seder? 
Well, the word Kadesh, which comes from the word Kadosh, meaning holy. Kadesh is to sanctify. We want to sanctify God's name. That is to, to relate to people. We know that God is holy. Now, holy is related to purpose. So we have a purpose in this holy meal. And that is to retell the story of the Exodus and point to that great Exodus. And that is bringing sinful people out of the bondage of sin into a newness of life through the blood of the Lamb that is Messiah Yeshua. We need to remember that, that Paul tells us in Corinthians that Messiah Yeshua, he is our Passover. That's why I say if someone doesn't have a Passover experience, meaning faith in the true Passover lamb, Yeshua or Jesus, that person is not going to be redeemed. And therefore, without redemption, it is impossible to worship God. You can know God, that he exists, but you can't experience him in his intimacy. You can't worship him properly unless you've been redeemed. So the first thing that's done is we sanctify God's name. And we do that with a, a blessing, a blessing over the fruit of the vine. Now, you're going to see that on this table, there are one, two, three, four cups. Because during the Seder, there are Arba Kosot wine, four cups of wine. Now, wine is a generic term. It can mean wine, like you think, an alcoholic beverage. But the term yain can also be tirosh, which is mitz anavim or grape juice. And today I'm using grape juice, but grape juice has the status of wine. Now, we say a blessing in order to sanctify God's name and to set apart this service. Not simply to eat and satisfy ourselves, but we do that in order to retell the story of God's favor, God's providence. God's redemption that he gave his people. And we lift up the cup, the first one, which is the cup of sanctification. And we say, and I'm going to use names of God, not the biblical names, but ones that simply refer to God. But we don't want to take the sacred name of God in vain. So instead of saying that sacred name of God, I'm going to simply say Hashem, which is the name. And likewise, instead of saying Elohim, I'm going to substitute Elohim. So the blessing is, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu, Malak HaOlam, Borei, Borei Peri HaGefen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates, Borei Peri, who creates the fruit, HaGefen, of the vine. And then we drink. And you should drink the first entire cup. And then we move on to the second element of the Passover Seder. Now, let me share with you something that's very important in regard to the Seder. When we go through these elements, I'm just highlighting each one very briefly. But hopefully you will be led by the Holy Spirit to think about sanctification and look in a concordance and find key verses in regard to sanctification and read them at that time. The whole purpose of the Passover Seder from a rabbinical standpoint, from a biblical standpoint, from a believing standpoint is to tell about God as the Redeemer. And what should our response be to the redemption that we've received by faith? Now, the next thing that's done is called the Yerchatz. The first, Kadesh. The second is the Yerchatz. And what is that? Well, that is a ceremonial hand washing. It's traditional. It is not biblical. And I want to get at this time. I want to get at this time what's called a natla. A natla is a vessel. We fill it up with water and then we pour it over. Notice that there's two handles to this natla in order that we pour using each handle as we pour the water over our hands. Now, what is the significance of this? Well, traditionally, the priests and the Levites, before they served in the Mishkan, the tabernacle, or in the Mikdash, Bet HaMikdash, the temple, or before some other sacred labor, wherever it was, they would wash their hands. 
oftentimes also immersing the entire body. But the point is this, to rid ourselves, it was a ceremonial washing reminding ourselves we can't serve God if we have dirty hands, meaning hands stained with sin. So it was in regard to repentance and acknowledgement of our sinfulness and a desire to have those sins taken away so that we can serve God. So at this time, the Yerchatz is done. And the reason for that is because of the next portion of the Seder. And that is known as the Karpas. Now, I'm going to pick up what is referred to as Karpas, Petrozilia in Hebrew. And what it is, is just parsley. Now, we look at this and we see that it's green. Green signifies life. And the Hebrews, they had life in Egypt. Even though they were in bondage, they had a physical life. And God blessed them. Remember, they grew, they multiplied, they became strong. And what happens? Well, the Egyptians saw them. The Pharaoh forgot about Joseph. That is, that the Jewish people were a blessing to the Egyptians. And he became insecure. He saw the blessings upon them, and he wanted to destroy them. And therefore, he put them into hard labor. He wanted to kill the male children, the ones who were born, and cast them into the, the, the river, the Nile River. And therefore, all the suffering and the death and the tears. So what we do is we say another blessing. See, we remember that in Judaism, we want to praise God for everything. So almost every activity has a blessing, a different blessing. This is similar. Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu, bless are you, O Lord our God, Malach Olam, King of the Universe, Borei Puri Hadama, who creates the fruit of the ground. And parsley, it is from the ground. After doing that, we dip it into salt water. Why salt water? Because the salt water reminds us of tears. Remember I talked about even though they were alive there and they multiply and they grew strong, they were weeping because of all their labor and sadness and the death that they were encountering. So after dipping the, the parsley into the salt water, we look at it, all those tears and suffering didn't change that our life is not based in this world, but how God made us, that we are to be alive with him. And therefore, after looking upon it and seeing that the tears didn't change the green, we are to partake of it. So people would partake of it and move on to the next section. The next section is called the yachatz. The yachatz comes from the Hebrew word, which means to divide. And it focuses upon the matzah. Now, look at the matzah for a moment. I don't know if you can see, but, but matzah is pierced. It is striped. And we need to remember that the scripture, it calls Yeshua the bread of life. And matzah is unleavened bread, but it has the status in Judaism as bread. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But the next thing we do is we speak about the matzah. And we mention that as Yeshua was pierced and he was bruised and striped for our sins and our transgressions and our iniquity. He suffered in our behalf. Now, what do we do at this time? Well, we take the matzah and we do something. We put it into this bag. And this bag has three compartments. Why three? Well, there's different beliefs. I believe it speaks about the number three because many places in Judaism, the number three, when it relates to God, it speaks about his holiness. Why? Well, three times a day, we say, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh Hashem Tzavot. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I believe there's three compartments because of the triune nature of God. God the Father, God the, holy, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's very, very significant that we look at the first compartment. We look at the second one. We look at the third. Each one has matzah in it but what's important is this we don't take the first one we don't take the second one what do we do well it's very important that we see that we take the middle piece of matzah and we break it and we take the larger portion we put the smaller one back in the second compartment 
Now remember, the first one represented God the Father. The third one, God the Holy Spirit. The second one, the Son, is what's taken out, and it's broken, and it's to signify death. Why do I say that? Well, you take this portion of matzah, and you take a white garment, very similar to the takrechin, and you take this piece of matzah, and you wrap it up, and you hide it. You bury it. You put it under cover. And that is to signify the most important part of the Passover Seder. And we'll come back to that at the end of the, the meal that represents the beginning of the second half of the Passover Seder. So remember, that matzah, well, it was representing the second one, which relates to the sun. And this matzah was bruised, striped, pierced, broken, and put into the garment and hidden away, like buried. That all points to the person and the work of Yeshua. Now here again, the brokenness, we know the scripture commands that the Passover lamb can have no broken bones. Yeshua had no broken bones. But when it says broken, it's simply a reference to death. And Yeshua certainly died in our behalf. Now, the next portion of the Passover Seder after the Echatz is the Magid. And this is a very important word in the Bible. The Magid. Why is that? Well, the term Magid, remember the book that we used a few minutes ago called the Haggadah from the word Lehagid to tell. Well, there's also the term Magid, which is a noun. It speaks about the one who tells. And therefore, this section called the Magid is the proclamation where the leader of the Seder, where he tells the story of Passover. Now, the Magid portion has several different elements. For example, it begins with what's called the Lechem Ani. It speaks about the Arba Banim and old other sections as well. The Lechem Ani, remember, we're talking not about normal bread, but unleavened bread. Lechem Ani, it's called the poor man's bread. But literally, Ani can mean poor, but it's from the Hebrew word La Note, which means to afflict. So Lechem Ani is afflicted bread because Yeshua was afflicted because of our transgression. And then it speaks about four sons, four very different sons. And it's to refer to us that children are different. And we need to tell the truth of God and his work of redemption, not based upon how we understand it, but we need to put it in terms so that each person can understand it. These four sons, very different. So as we tell the story of Passover, we tell it differently to each of these four sons so that each of them can understand and respond. You see, Passover always demands a response. Well, there's another section of the Megid, and that has to do with the second cup. We take the second cup towards the end of this section called the Megid, and we dip our finger into the tirosh, the grape juice, and we make droplets, 10 droplets in regard to the 10 plagues. Now, also, also we do something else. We remember what's written in the prophecy, Nivuato Shel Yoel, that is the prophecy of Joel. And there it talks about before the judgment of God, literally his wrath, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And there, it talks about uh, smoke and fire and such. And it speaks of three things. So we additionally add three droplets to the ten to come up with 13. Why 13? Well, 13 is a great number according to Jewish tradition. It speaks about 12 plus 1. 12, the children of Israel, God's people, and 1. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is 1. So it speaks about unity between 12 and 1, 13. Unity between the people of God and God himself. 
And after doing those, those droplets, we read a little bit from the Psalms. I'm going to talk more about this later on. But there's a portion of Psalms, Psalm 113 through 118, also Psalm 136. And we read some of those at this time. And after concluding that section of those Psalms, the beginning of the Hallel, we make the blessing again, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Malak HaOlam, Borei Puri HaGefen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and we partake of the second cup. Now, after the second cup, we do something. We move on to the first, what I would call, biblical element of the Seder. According to the scripture, when we look at the book of Exodus, there's three things that we must have for a Passover Seder. And that is the Passover lamb, the matzah, and the third is the bitter herbs. Now, today, because Yeshua is our Passover lamb, we do not use or sacrifice another lamb. Plus, there's no altar because there's no temple in Jerusalem. So we really don't keep Passover today. When we do the Seder, we're not keeping Passover. We're using the Seder to remember Passover. We're utilizing Passover in order to have a positive spiritual effect, remembering those biblical truths, remembering those scriptures, reading them, studying them at the time when Passover occurred and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But we're not literally obeying the Torah admonitions and commandments in regard to Passover. Because as I said, there's no temple. So there was three biblical elements, the Passover lamb, the matzah, and the, the bitter herbs called the maror. Now, this is the time when we're going to do the second of these, the matzah. Now, remember, I share with you that matzah is lechem ani, lechem meaning bread, unleavened bread, bread which is afflicted. And what we need to realize is because we're going to partake of matzah in a second, we say the blessing for partaking of bread, which is Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Malach HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaArts. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who does what? Who brings forth bread from the earth. And after that, we say another before we eat. Usually, after making that blessing, we eat of the bread immediately. But not so at Passover. There's another blessing. Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedishanu B'Mitzvatav V'Tzivanu Al Achilat Matzah Which means, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with His commandments and commanded us to eat matzah. And then we break off a piece and we partake. Now, many people have problem with this phrase, Asher Kedishanu B'Mitzvatav Which means, and has sanctified us with his commandments. They said, we're not sanctified. They understand that sanctified relates to the term holy. Sanctification is a process of being holy. They say, we're not saved by the commandments. We're saved by the blood of God. That's right. The blood of the Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua. But holiness is not the same thing as justification. Holiness is not being saved. Holiness is wrapped up, that word, holy, is wrapped up in purpose. So when it says you're sanctified by the commandments, it means that we're set apart for a purpose, and that purpose is to do the word of God. So we need to be careful and not to place upon different blessings our understanding rather than the proper understanding of what the author of these blessings intended. We are indeed set apart for a purpose, and we read about that purpose in the Word of God, among the laws of God, the commandments of God. So after completing this element, eating of the matzah, we move on to the second element, and that is called the maror. Maror is a Hebrew word that relates to mar or bitterness. So it's the bitter herbs. Now, what's important about that? 
Well, it also speaks about uh, uh, the work that we did, was, which bondage to, to the Egyptians was symbolized as sin. So the moror reminds us of the bitterness of sin. There's also a blessing for this, very similar. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech olam, asher kedeshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu al achilat moror. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the eating of bitter herbs or moror. Now, normally how we do that is that we take a little bit and we put it upon the matzah and then we partake. So after the matzah and the moror, there's another tradition. Not biblical, but one that uh, helps us. It's the next part, the korech, which is sandwich. And we take two pieces of matzah, like two pieces of bread, and we take what's called charoset. Charoset is a mixture of wine and uh, chopped up apples and chopped up uh, walnuts. And we put that in between the two pieces of matzah. Oftentimes there's a correct connection or a tradition to put uh, a little moror with it as well because this reminds us as well of the labor, the labor of building the, the, the work that we did in the uh, Egyptian for Pharaoh, the mortar and such, but also it can relate to the temple. And we know that we received the temple by as well some bitterness that we had to turn away from sin. So the tradition is that we make a little sandwich and we partake of it because it's strictly traditional. There is no blessing for that. Now, at that time, we conclude the first part of the Seder. And let's go through it again. The first element is the Kadesh, that is, sanctifying this mill for the purposes of God. The second one is the Yerchatz, the ceremonial washing that we did because we were going to dip the parsley into liquid. And because perhaps our hand also went in, we wanted to remove any uncleansiness, both ceremonially and also spiritually, from our hands if we were to dip it into the water, not to mix or have a transfer. This is traditional, not saying biblical. Thirdly, we did the karpas, that is the dipping of that parsley into the salt water. Then we proceeded with the yachatz, the uh, separating, the dividing of the middle matzah and wrapping it up and making a very important element that we'll talk about later. After that, the magid. This is where we retell the Passover story. And then also we have the motzi, the matzah, and the moror and the korech. So the first part of the Passover Seder. After that, we eat. After consuming the Passover meal, which oftentimes conser, conser, uh, consists of, of roast beef and potatoes. Potatoes are very important and traditional to eat during Passover and all the things that go along with the traditional meal. We then conclude by the final portion of the eating. And that is when we go to the portion here. Now, traditionally, what we do is we ask the children to find it because a leader of the Seder hides it. And the children find it, and then we have to buy it back from them. Why? To teach about redemption. Redemption is a purchase. It is a transaction. Messiah's blood paid for our redemption. So we follow that tradition. And it's very significant when we... Uncover the piece of matzah. Remember, it related to Yeshua. We need to remember what it's called. The Alfi Koman. The Alfi Koman is not a Hebrew word, nor is it Aramaic. It is actually Greek. 
And the term alphikoman comes from the Greek word erchomai, and in this form it means I have come. So it's significant. This relates to Messiah. And what do we call it? We call it I have come, meaning Messiah came. And where did he go? He went to the cross when on Passover. Now, there's something also important. In Hebrew, you will find not only the term Afikoman, but in many Haggadot, remember the books that uh, help us go through the Seder, the proper order and tell what we need to tell, you'll find many times that they'll have the phrase Safun. Safun means hidden. And it can relate to two things. We hid the Afikoman. But in English, oftentimes, they have the term safun, and they put next to it in English, dessert, because it's the last thing that is eaten in the Passover meal. It does not mean dessert. It means, like I said, hidden. And why is that important? Because Messiah has been hidden from his people. And therefore, through the Seder, we can share the truth. We can uncover all the blindness and all the false teachings concerning Messiah and reveal why he came, what he did, why, when he did it, and the outcome of that, that he is our redeemer. So Yeshua, he took the Alfi Komen and he divided it up piece by piece to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, remember? Pierce, also striped and bruised. He says, this is my body which is given to you. So the Alfi Komen relates to Messiah, his body, he came and he gave his body that we might have life. Now, after the Alfi Komen, there is what's called the final bracha of the mill. Now, it's not the final bracha, the final blessing for the Seder, but it's the final one of the mill. And we know in Judaism, we follow the scripture from Deuteronomy where it says, when you have tasted your food and are satisfied, you give thanks to the Lord your God. So the grace is not before the meals as many people do. But biblically speaking, if we want to be right according to scripture, we say the grace after the meal. And that's what's done at this time. And after that bracha, it ends with the third cup. Now, the first cup is called the cup of sanctification. The second one is called the cup of thanksgiving, that we remember the exodus from Egypt and we give thanks to God. The third cup, remember it says in the scripture that Yeshua, after the supper, just like we did, after the supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. See, every covenant needs to be ratified with blood. And therefore, the third cup is called the cup of redemption. It signifies his blood. Now, I want to stop for a moment and, and point out what Yeshua did with his disciples that night when he instituted the Lord's Supper. What was the Lord's Supper? Well, let me tell you what the Lord's Supper was not. It was not a Passover Seder. I want to say that again. The Lord's Supper, what he ate with his disciples, was not a Passover Seder. A Passover Seder would have been observed by the disciples, but after Messiah had died upon that cross, after he'd been put into that tomb by Joseph of Arimathea and Nachdimon Nicodemus. They would have went through a Passover Seder, which hopefully they would have remembered what he taught the night before. Now, what did he do with his disciples the night before? Well, this is very important because we know, according to Jewish tradition, that the 14th day of Nisan, Passover, the day that the lamb is sacrificed, is also a fast day. And the night before, they would have eaten what you do before every fast, and that is a seuda second. Seuda is a meal, a meal with a purpose, a meal in regard to a mitzvah, a commandment. So it's seudat, the tav at the end, signifies of. So a meal of, a 
and Mifsekhet is stopping or ceasing. So you take a break from eating. So that's what was done. See, we need to remember Passover celebration, this observance, began on the 10th day of the first month of the year, the month of Aviv in the spring. And the lambs were brought into the home. The next observance was to take those lambs and sacrifice it on the 14th day. But remember, that's a fast day. So the evening before, at the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 14th in the evening, they would eat a special meal, a last supper, before the Passover Seder. And what was the tradition? Well, you wouldn't eat it necessarily with your family. No, the men would go to their spiritual leader, and he would have a meal that was very similar to a Passover Seder, meaning the elements, and he would go through them teaching. So when the men went back the next night with their family, they could go and teach new things, things that they learned, additional things. So they would always grow in their understanding of God's work of redemption. That's why it says in the Haggadah, the one who marbe, that is to, to, to increase and expand the Passover Seder, he is praiseworthy. Why? He's telling more and more insight in regard to the meaning of the Lord's redemption. So after the meal, Yeshua would have taken that Alfi Komen, and he would also taken the third cup, the cup of redemption. Notice that he blessed it. Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu, Malach HaOlam, Borei Pri HaGefen. Bless are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And you would have partaken of. Now, there's just a few elements left. At that time, that time, we find that we turn to the book of Psalms. Remember, at the conclusion of the Megid, we begin a portion of Psalms from Psalm 113, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and Psalm 136. Back at the Megid, we did the first few of them. But now we conclude. And we conclude with that great Psalm, Psalm 136. But before we do, we emphasize Psalm 118. And if you read the last part of Psalm 118, it talks about the Lord becoming salvation. It talks about the, the one that Messiah is, that rock that was rejected, that was literally despised, that this rock has become the chief cornerstone. And you know, Rashi even says that this rock, this rejected one, is Messiah. So we read at the end of Psalm 118 about that sacrifice that God provided. There's a very interesting phrase there. It talks about the sacrifice that was bound to the altar. Now, that should cause a problem. Because remember, one of the things I've taught before is that these, these Passover offerings, there was 250,000 minimally sheep or lambs slaughtered on Passover. Therefore, there was enough time to bind that sacrifice to the altar. So what does it mean about binding a sacrifice to an altar? It wasn't done. Well, it does, was done with someone, and that is Yitzchak, at Akidat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. And that binding of Isaac, if we read that story in Genesis 22, we read so much of that that relates to what was done with Messiah. How... Yitzchak, that is Isaac, carried the wood, how Messiah carried his cross. All of this came about on the third day. So many things that, that Yitzchak, he rode upon a donkey, and likewise Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. All these things come tied together so that we can understand the truth of the word of God. So at this time, we read and conclude Psalm 118, then we pour the final cup, the cup of praise, where we conclude the Hallel. And we read Psalm 136, where we emphasize, Ki leolam chasdo, forever is God's loving kindness, his mercy, his steadfast love. We read Psalm 136, and we partake of the fourth cup with that blessing, Baruch atah Adonai, Melech olam, 
Bore Pri Hagefen. Bless are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, Malachi Olam, Bore Pri Hagefen, who creates the fruit of the vine. And when we partake of the fourth cup, the fourth and final cup, we pause, we make a statement concerning that our Passover Seder was done completely correct, and then we go to the Nirzah. And that is when we say, well, next year, God willing, we'll do it in Jerusalem. Meaning that we hope that the redemption, that final redemption, Messiah's return will come. Now, there's one last thing that I want to mention, and that's done a little bit earlier, but I saved it for the end because of a very important truth, and that is this. We set at our table an extra place setting for Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. And after the meal, we go to the door and we see if Elijah's there. We even call for Elijah by singing. And the reason for that is the view that Elijah is going to come. He's the forerunner for Messiah. And Elijah will come. He is going to bring unity of the people. We read that in the prophecy of Malachi, where it says in Malachi that Elijah is going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their father. He's going to bring unity in the home. And that's what redemption does. It brings unity in the home. When we all express and follow and respond to the perfect redemption of the Lord that was achieved for us through Messiah Yeshua. So again, we begin with the Kadesh and then the Yerchatz, the Karpas, Yachatz, Magid, Motzi, Matzah, Maror, Korech, Shuchan or Ruch, that is the, the mill, the, the Afikoman, the Tzafun, and then the Bracha, which is the grace after the mill, the Berch, and then Hallel and Nirza. All of these things we can do in order to utilize Scripture, putting them in so people can understand God's revelation. Well, I'm out of time. May you have a Pesach Semeach Ve Kasher, which is a happy and kosher Pesach. One that's done in praise to the Lamb of God, the eternal Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua. Thank you for watching, and may God richly bless you.